Okay, I think we're going to start. Uh, I just want to thank Paul, actually, for accepting to give a lecture. We at the DRL basically have uh, an invited guest lecture after what is pretty much a pretty hardcore day for us, actually evaluating the kind of work. And I think Paul, for us, is an interesting uh, introduction for a lecture today, uh, following up on times when I think a lot of people are trying to put their finger on the pulse of literally what is the future projection and kind of forecasting in terms of the kind of strategy to make a lot of this kind of more experimental work actually applicable to a lot of real world problems. And Paul is one of those strategic minds that I think has the ear of a lot of architects. He's consulted with many of the people that you read about and talk about on, on projects that have actually obviously been very influential to a course like this. And, uh, in terms of Paul's lecture tonight, he's going to be speaking about a series of different strategies and dealing with issues of hardware, software. He's titled the lecture, Next and Again, Progress and Recurrence. We're going to keep this introduction short, but uh, Paul Nagazawa teaches at Harvard's Graduate School. He's taught prior to SIARC and so forth, and he's joining us basically for Boston for the next two days. So if you guys can, please welcome Paul. Thank you. Um, my, my premise tonight is uh, something that I think the, would be accepted as, a, as an assertion at the AA, which is about the nature of technology in, in the current age in terms of the business models and evolutionary paths of technological industries having a, um, a profound impact on other businesses, uh, including our own. And um, from what I saw today, uh, a lot of you are <laughs> deep, deep in the water of, of uh, uh, digital work. Um, a lot of it foreign to my eyes, but uh, probably because I'm a, a, of a generation before digital. Um, but uh, nevertheless, these developments uh, culturally uh, point to the next set of opportunities in practice, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. But I want to do it a little bit from a developmental standpoint. So this isn't really about practice um, directly, but really about looking outside of practice to another industry, which is the computer industry, to see if we can learn something about where we are as a, as a culture, a practice, and a business. And um, that industry has three distinct uh, domains. One is uh, hardware, uh, which uh, for me is really d machines and devices. The other is software in, in terms of applications. And finally, what I call netware, it's a probably cheesy term, but it's really about connectivity. And um, if you look at the structure of, of industries and companies built around that, this is, I'm, I'm, I use this as a, a suggestive diagram to show you kind of what, what in, intuitively uh, I'm talking about so that you can see the, the kinds of firms that I would place in each position. And the ones that are interesting to me particularly are those in the overlaps between these, and we can get into it. Uh, again, uh, further in the lecture, but for me, the, the, it's the overlaps is where all, all the action is. That's where all the kind of messy, kind of interesting things that are, are, are difficult to, res to resolve uh, start happening. And so uh, in the overlaps of practice between different domains is to me where the, where the action ultimately is. So. Um, I want to discuss these things, value proposition, business model, design drivers, and transformation points. Value propositions are something that probably to design students is a foreign, fairly foreign term. I mean, uh, in business lingo, it's kind of old hat. But it, it's, it's really what's the val what, it, what are you laying out on the table as a value? What, what, everything that we do has a value to somebody. Hopefully, uh, if it's to somebody who is interested in commissioning you to do something, that's of a more immediate and tangible value than if it's simply 
um, a singular pursuit that you have as, a, as your own thing. It may be enjoyable, but no one's going to pay you for it. Uh, and there are various uh, ways in, in which values are um, expressed. Uh, in, in market terms, it's the offer, in which case the offer uh, is what you offer to do somebody. It's what, what it is that you're offering to do for somebody else in terms of realizing that value. The business model that we're discussing is, is basically the recipe for the, the, the primary elements that make a business viable. The design drivers are that. What, what is driving the design, and whether it's a value proposition or a business model, design is involved, which is an idea about how you take uh, elements and, and, and actually drive it through a business in a way that creates value. And then everyone's interested in transformation points. I hear a lot of, about people saying innovation, innovation, innovation. And those transformation points are, are also interesting. Before most of you were born, uh, in the, at the end of, uh, well, actually during World War II, uh, the first large computers were being uh, made on a research basis. The ENIAC, which is the Electronic Numeric Integrator and in Computer, was uh, secretly commissioned in 1943 uh, to the University of Pennsylvania a School of Electrical Engineering. It, it was a World War II project. As you can imagine, it had military application. Basically, the US military was interested in numeric projections of trajectories of, of, of missiles, whether, right? So um, they were looking for, for numeric, numeric calculators that could uh, do this with trajectories. The Germans, of course, had done this very successfully w through Krupp Industries with slide rules and uh, you know, kind of the, the mathematics. But the, the United States had decided that the way to do this was through computation, electronic computation. This machine had 17,000. 468 vacuum tubes, some which, of which were this big, uh, 7,200 crystal diodes, 1,500 relays, 70,000 resistors, 10,000 capacitors, 5 million hand-soldered joints. Uh, it weighed 30 tons. It was 2.6 meters by 0.9 meters by 26 meters. It took 64 square meters of floor space, and it, it ran at 150 kilowatts of power which means that in today's terms, at 12 cent, 11 to 12 cents a kilowatt hour, it was, would cost you 16,000 to 18,000 pounds per hour to run this machine. <laughs> the, 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 OK, can you imagine paying for a computer 16,000 pounds an hour? Uh, and yet, that's the equivalent of what uh, they were paying for that. And the joke in Philadelphia was, when something happened at UPenn, the lights went out in the city. And that's because this machine was drawing 150 kilowatts of capacity. Uh, th on the right uh, is 1K of memory before the uh, invention of mag magnetic core memory. And underneath is the vast improvement over the ENIAC, also done by the original designers of ENIAC, the UNIVAC, Universal Automatic Computer, which made a huge leap uh, by taking it down from 17,000 vacuum tubes to 5,000 vacuum tubes, et cetera, et cetera. Still weighed 13 metric tons, uh, but was much smaller. So uh, within your parents' generation, <laughs> or grandparents' generation, the computers of yesteryear come to today where you can port more than a lot of power that they had in your, in your hand. So the design drivers that uh, were prevalent at that time were computational speed and capacity. It was really clear. You needed more of that. You needed to shrink it. You couldn't pay 16,000 pounds an hour for electricity. It had to be cheaper, cheaper to build, cheaper to operate. Needed to be reliable. Um, and most importantly, it needed to be scalar in manufacturing because without that, you couldn't put
put it in all the military hardware that people were thinking about, from tanks to submarines. And so the value proposition at the time of, uh, around World War II was computers were good as numeric processors, and if you could design to these criteria and drive these d design criteria through a series of, of, of iterations, you could actually achieve something that was useful, at least for certain people. The, uh, actually, the UNIVAC was done for the census. So other than you know, killing people and shooting things, the other thing was counting for people. And the reason that was important is it translated into votes. So being able to count and figure out the census was equally important. Interesting, right? So the key innovators that allowed the design drivers to, uh, to be realized were the invention of transistors and semiconductors, which would replace the vacuum tube. So vacuum tubes like that big, and a transistor is that big, or now you can't even see the transistor because it's so small. There's the, in, the invention of the integrated circuit, which actually replaced the, trans, the, the, the vacuum tube. It allows capacitors and resistors to be on the same board. The invention of random access memory. The, the magnetic core memory, which allowed it not to be that other big thing, and the, and the microprocessor. So one of the, one of the um, consequences of having a limited number of design drivers that really were um, held, uh, as held up as, the, as a you know, limited number of things that people were aiming for, created a value chain of uh, in the establishment of an industry where people were devoted to solving problems through driving design, either through computational speed, smaller size, whatever, some variation of all three. You could, you, you could, you could get it, right? I mean, you didn't have all these extraneous noise in it. You, these were the things you were aiming for. If you succeeded, you were rewarded. If you didn't, you went out of business. So the business model, the things that kept things uh, uh, going for these folks were you had to innovate. Uh, the means of protecting your innovations was the patent. Um, you had to produce. You, uh, early in the phase, you had to produce it in a custom-built environment. In the next phase, it was product lines. And finally, it was mass customization to market. Sorry? The, the business ultimately wound up as being a, a volume sales uh, I issue. If you only sold ENIACs and they were one, one at a time, you didn't have an industry. And you didn't have the critical mass of intellect and resources necessary to make the innovations that subsequently happened. So one of the key things about the hardware business was that you needed to have a critical mass and you needed to have a value chain and you needed, most of all, to have a limited number of design drivers in order to create an industry where you could actually innovate because the resources would be concentrated and constant. And finally, the, the, the business model of hardware has something that architects only wish they could have, which is Moore's Law, which uh, postulates that the number of transistors on a chip will double every two years with a reduction of cost every, every iteration. And Intel Corporation has done that for 40 years, every year, starting in 1959. So it's the, the obsolescence factor of the hardware business was built in through the, the ability of people to gain larger and larger speeds at a lower cost every year. So over time, now we, we, I, I left you off in the 1950s. In this, by the 1960s, you had exponents of different kinds of machines. They were still machines. Actually, the applications all had to be uh, custom built. So you had exponents of the mainframe, and you had exponents of a mini computer. Uh, it was a time uh, if if you were reading the newspaper or anything. These people who were doing these things 
were as famous as any star architect is today. I mean, they, they would be in the newspaper. You would read about them in the newspaper. The, they, were they were high designers in every sense of the word, uh, developing uh, uh, products and, and objects that were worthy of, of being, they were newsworthy and, and celebrated uh, in, the, in, the, in the newspapers. But th these things also started to become uh, fetishized in the sense that the developers of these different systems also had design formalism that crept in, meaning that there were there were there were rules and and uh, different ru different rules applied to the design of hardware that kept them in in a form that really got in the way of further innovation, which was the micro the invention of the microcomputer, and so that by the late 60s, early 70s, there were different companies that had locked themselves into canonical forms of computation machines. And it was only subsequent uh, kind of developments which would break the, the, the canonical forms of, of, of object making, basically, that um, would then transform the entire business. Um, running in parallel. Uh, if you, I mean, if you we could do different kinds of buildings. I, I took high rise because every everyone's kind of familiar with it. But uh, circa 1891, the the structure of choice was load bearing masonry for tall buildings, and uh, Burnham and Root, the world's largest architectural practice at the time, did the proto sky skyscraper in Chicago in b load bearing masonry. And it wouldn't be until the early 50s, late 40s, early 50s that people would pioneer the application of curtain wall, which would make the building lighter, uh, cheaper. <laughs> I mean, if you start going down the, the design criteria, you will, you will see that there, there are, were a parallel system universe of, of uh, design drivers that uh, were allied with commercial development of real estate they were, they're not the same as computers, but th there was this kind of understanding of, of uh, different design drivers driving things to innovation in certain specific ways. They were cost-driven in many cases. It wasn't innovation for innovation's sake. A lot of this was driven by the need of construction speed, cost, uh, space saving, um, and understand that behind each of these kinds of approaches, to building, there's a value chain of suppliers and material makers and everything that has to be inflated in order for an industry to work. You, ha you actually have to have a supply chain. So in order for you to do load-bearing masonry, you have to have people who make load-bearing load masonry, I mean, you have to bricks that meet those specs, et cetera, et cetera. To do curtain wall, the first couple can be done uh, bespoke, but after that, the technology dies unless you're able to have a, uh, an industry that builds itself up around the supply of things needed to make these things. And then we come to today where we just seem to be in love with tallness and we've fixated on form and we, we, can f we feel we can overdo it. But uh, this is kind of probably no different than the, the c computer makers of of the 1970s who were attached to uh, to mainframes. In, in fact, the ultimate design drivers are lost in terms of a cost benefit, and so you you start violating the original design drivers that that took you to an innovative kind of thing, and then you repeat your innovation ad nauseum until the value that's received is less than your investment. The big, the big destabilizer for the computer hardware industry were the appearance of software people who decided that applications of, of, of just doing uh, military applications or census or whatever, everything being custom built was, was not going to work anymore. And so the idea of machine started turning into one of platform. But at the beginning, everyone understood it as machines with applications. And, and it wasn't until much later that with, with the variety of software that was written that it, it was understood as a platform. So on your left is the 
the be all and end all of machine age and typing, which is the self correcting selectric typewriter, which most of you were not, not born when it was in use, but trust me, for the old guys, this was, this was the cat's meow. Now, on the other side is the Wang word processor. A mic it was a, a microcomputer with a single application, which was word processing. But Wang, D Dr. Wang, who, who founded this company, was a brilliant scientist, uh, physicist, and um, actually embraced the, micro uh, the microprocessor as with its potential, but neglected to understand the commercialization of what he had just done, and so made it kept, kept making it a machine. He just put one application onto the microprocessor, and so uh, doomed his company to the trash bin of history because he was too late in terms of understanding the potential for software to be written in for many different applications. And so when WordPerfect and a number of other kind of software uh, providers came along uh, for micro, uh, microcomputers, Wang tanked and was never heard from again. Same thing happened with DEC with the mini computers. So at this point, main, mainframe makers, mini computer makers, and supercomputer makers all started to be, become um, attached to th the things that they made and one by one went out of business. So IBM itself didn't go out of business. Their mainframe division went out of business. DEC's uh, mini computer, well, DEC was, went out of business. Um, DEC was the maker of the mini computers that ran the early CAD machines, the Intergraph CAD machines and MicroStation machines that were, were made in the, in the 80s and up to the early 90s were all run on PDP uh, microcomputers by DEC. And they, they just couldn't make the transition from that to an, another kind of hardware. So this, this kind of uh, tr transition of being able to write software for a platform and, and make it a market rather than a single application destroyed, destroyed the hardware business in, in, in computation. I mean, it literally destroyed it. Uh, the, the, those uh, divisions went out of business and were replaced by a whole bunch of other players. And their, under, their understanding, the hardware people now had to get used to a whole different kind of animal on the plane, which was the software provider who looked at the hardware as an instrument to create value, but not as a thing in and of itself. So what was important was not simply the computer, but what it could do with, an app, with different applications. And so the business model for the software company was the enablement and enhancement of work, leisure, and systems that support the operation of society. I'm, I'm, I'm making it a very broad. Uh, you didn't uh, patent your stuff, you, you licensed it. Um, you versioned your applications and you scheduled obsolescence. It wasn't like Moore's Law where you could just on a technical basis, you could get more, more uh, transistors on a chip. So you could just get a faster chip every, every two years. It was actually that you had to schedule the death of your own intellectual property. Um, there were integration ap integrated application suites. They were bundled or modularized. This whole concept of bundling will, will reappear in architecture in a really big way, in the architectural business, actually. Um, you had open and, and closed proprietary source codes. There were different models for open and closed models. And the IP uh, protection was copyright. So one was patent, the other copyrighted. The, uh, the, the, the versioning uh, introduced something which, uh, the versioning and bundling were very key uh, points to the business model, which would which ultimately would be reflected in architecture. I'm not saying it's causal. I'm just saying is that from an I it was an interesting parallel in terms of time frame. Key innovations here were higher order computer languages and code compilers, uh, the operating system, which made peripheral devices and computers much more useful, the artificial intelligence uh, field, uh, and data integrity and security, all of which were important 
for uh, software. Now, in a parallel universe, not in academia, this is in commercial practice. The business model of commercial practice shifted from object making to the development of specialized domain knowledge. So uh, whereas an architect before would be local, would have many different building types, and would be allowed to, to do different building types be based on being just an, arch being an architect, right? Suddenly, there appeared competition which specialized in domain knowledge, which would make you an expert in, chem in K through 12, or an expert in hospitals, or an expert in office buildings. And so the development of these domain knowledge things corresponded to software applications. The, embedment in, the embedding and integration of domain knowledge into the design process um, design product or environment, so it was a process now of taking that specialized domain knowledge and is in embedding it in a design pro process or product. It was versioned, meaning that people would do Hospital 101, Hospital 102, right? I mean, there would be innovations along the way, and those companies would build market share based on their ability to version their knowledge and embed it in, in, in successive projects in, in, uh, in the market. They bundled in, in the bundling and integration of applications. What do I mean by that? Um, the software business in architecture and in the, s and the, r the computer software business spawned an incredible number of subspecialists. Because what happens is when you have specialized domain knowledge, it can be subdivided into smaller bits. And so what happens is that you get an increasing number of specialists that can do bits and pieces of it, which makes the software business extremely innovative, but also um, difficult because you have, you, 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 you know, they're code specialists and they're people of, of every ilk. So if you look at the number of specialties subspecialties in the design field in 1970, and you look at the number of design subspecialties right now, I mean, it's in multiples of five or ten. We, we would not, in, in, in 1970, have, you know, 20 or 30 com consultants on a job, and now uh, a large job, I mean, it's not unusual to have 25 consultants. And so what we did as architects is what we actually took different domain knowledge players, we bundled them, and then we presented them to the client as we being the integrator of all that. And it's basically a software bundle, right? Which, by the way, in effect, in effect changes the price of the bundle because what's the cost of a, a word processor alone, and then what's the cost of a Microsoft Office suite, figure it out. It, you know, it was a way of selling you more software. <laughs> but it, it was also integrating all of the different complementary applications. So one of the other, the last thing was cross-sell domain knowledge and services, so that by doing that, it increased the volume of, of, of sales of, of knowledge. And whether that resulted in better architecture or not, I have no idea, but probably not. But um, uh, that's what happened. And then there was the final thing of the business model, which is collateral branding of the architect and client. And it indeed happened in the computer business as well, that there was collateral branding happening between hardware companies and software companies. So that there would be joint ventures between Microsoft and, and um, uh, Intel or Microsoft and other people who would make these things. Uh, market applications by building typology, type, typological uh, differentiation accelerated during the period uh, of the 1970s forward. Uh, there were market applications by type. There were uh, applications in, the, in technical systems, uh, everything, lighting, acoustic, seismic, uh, and regulatory applications. So, uh, 
examples of all of these, a, a lot of commercial uh, architectural firms would do market applications by building typology. So they would have different divisions of the of the practice that would that would specialize in different building typologies. Um, they were usually larger firms. There were those who were were technical consultants, and then. I mean, in the, the area of zoning uh, and regulatory applications, you know, one of the more interesting ones is Duani Plater Zyberg, the new urbanist, took uh, regulatory applications in the zoning code and forced changes in uh, the application of aggregation of hardware, meaning building, by actually specializing in, in looking at regulatory application and seeing how it played out in, in actual in implementation of, 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 of built environments. Um, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, uh, I, I'm following their, their high-rise stuff through. This is, an, uh, this is an early example of urban mixed-use uh, a tower. Um, had multifamily residential, commercial offices, restaurant, observation deck. We take this for granted. Actually, if you look at Burj Dubai, Th it's nothing more than this building on steroids. <laughs> I mean, the, the, uh, the actual original application of software and hardware, the hardware application here was the lightening of the structure. The, it, was an, it was an urban mixed use, which at the time was something new. I mean, not now, but you have to look historically at how these things happen. But uh, it was a successful marriage of hardware thinking and software thinking that, that actually Skidmore at that time was highly devoted to the integration of architectural innovation and engineering innovation and programmatic innovation in an urban context. And so they managed to get a value proposition which met a series of design criteria that would br deliver value to a client, a commercial developer, value to the, uh, a place in terms of its connectivity and value in terms of a, an over you know long-term investment in terms of how the program was set up in terms of software applications so now looking at this looks like old hat but at the time was an extremely innovative example of the, m the melding of these different co negotiating of these different kinds of forces. If you look at the Chicago skyline, I mean, Chicago is one of those cities which uh, the shape in, in itself doesn't mean anything. The, the, you know, it's a very practical city of industrialists looking for uh, value. And so the Hancock is up in, the, it, up in there. It doesn't really stand out from, from this field, unlike Dubai. This isn't so much about how commercial practices change, but it, it, it affected even, I think, uh, thinking about choices and how you do individual projects. So at the project level, it co uh, parenthetically, I was the managing principal of Moshe Safdie's practice when the Vancouver Public Library is done, and I was consulting the OMA during the, the designing of the Seattle Public Library. So I could see the differences in, in both approaches and choices that were made based on where you put your eyeball. So Safdie, who is the quintessential master builder and rooted in, in history, uh, starts from the hardware box and looks at the program of a library and the site and struggles with uh, how, with, uh, as all architects do, well, what to do. And the, and the overlap of application was taken in a, in a more conventional sense of taking the imprint of a library inside this kind of uh, Roman looking wrapper is a conventional rectangular library of three stories which functions like in a, in a more normative way of what libraries do, right? So the program itself the, the software application was not disturbed from a more normative thing that people would recognize. And the connectivity piece was actually rooted in ideas of civic. And so the, t the instrument of being able to affect that part of it was in the site plan. But it still remains an object. P 
put put on a put on a site and engages it at the at the ground level in a very specific way. A successful civic project, very popular, but the other one uh, is is rooted in Oma Amo, where. I think Rem uh, will be remembered for his contribution in the relationship between specific kinds of content and, and how it gets integrated in design, uh, stands in the bubble of application and looks then at the overlap with hardware and chooses to reconfigure the program in a way which is novel, but also to address the issue of, of connectivity on an inside-outside basis rather than on simply an object outside-inside basis. And so creates an environment inside in which civicness is present looking out. And as so far as, it, as you, 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 you pe people um, who are ob object people always look at the library and tell me, but it doesn't marry to the site very well. And you go like, well, um, that was probably deliberate. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and so e even with regard to where the eye of the architect is in those worlds, and th this is kind of the fascinating thing where I think some of you will find yourselves is where is your eyeball in the future, you know? Is it planted in hardware, software, network? And some of you who, are con where, who start from the perspective of connectivity will probably look at the other domains and make different choices. So it's not about you know, better architecture, bad architecture. It's like what choices are you making and how are you doing it, even down at a project level. And so here are two, two gentlemen who are extremely successful architects in their, own, in their own right. They have different kinds of clients and are appreciated by different audiences. But this kind of sensibility culturally starts to lead to uh, r really radic in the final end, r radically different choices. So we finally come to NetWare. The software companies were getting comfortable, and all of a sudden, uh, people are giving away software for free. You get uh, automatic downloads. Um, uh, you can reach into the cloud and pull down all your apps. Uh, and uh, the software business, uh, at least temporarily, goes into a tailspin as they come to grips with another business model on the plane which um, is based on brand branded web-based platforms that really enhance communications for social networking, merchandising, information dissemination, et cetera, right? So now this model, if the first model was, um, you know, I, it, it was almost, uh, object making is very simple. You know, you, there's an auth, the old fashioned way, right? There's an author. Uh, I made it, and I protect it because I patented it, and you don't have it, right? And so th then the the system, the software people are like, I I licensed it, I pa I copyrighted it, and you're going to pay me for every version that comes out because I'm I'm just going to keep making a new obsolescent. And the network people go like, well, intellectual property, well, we'll just make it open so everyone can contribute, <laughs> right? And and then and then we'll make it free because so it's a sponsored it's sponsored venues. But un understand something, all of you are wired. Y all your assumption walking around, even though you're in architectural school, your assumption walking around is it should be free. It's sponsored. It's like we should all participate. And so the, the, the mind's eye is wandering around. And so you, you bump into the, hard, the old time hardware people and the software folks, and you go, like, well, why, why do you think that? So I don't have the answer for how network plays out in architecture, but Here's the model in network. So in social re re uh, networking, the revenues are developed from ad advertising sponsorship and transaction fees. Yeah, that doesn't look like software. Uh, it's open source code for third party apps, hence the iPhone application store. Uh, merchandising, it's multi-channel platform, it's web-based in-store customer. You, you have choice. Uh, it's driven by human interface technologies. It's driven by search engines. It's driven by cl the cloud, meaning that you can reach up and get applications. It's enabled by certain kinds of hardware. So if you thought 
that the notebook computer was the instrument of choice, suddenly you're in the wrong business because it's now your, your cell phone, <laughs> right? And, and so all the makers of the, this stuff finally s find them themselves up uh, high and dry just as the, the makers of mainframes and supercomputers found themselves on a sandbar um, at the end of their era. Now Apple has avoided all of those things. It, it, it has you know, kind of looked at all of these transformations socially and has, has managed to be in every one of those bubbles over time. So there are some companies that have staked out an innovative position using design, right? Using design as, a, as, the, as the way of really navigating these different business models. So whenever people think that design doesn't count, this is a company where using design as, but not being attached to form though, that's the, the key, right? It's using technology and form as an enabler of value and not being attached to the form itself is one of the keys that keeps Apple nimble and searching for how to take, you know, how to make all of these things useful. Another key innovation is that and the erasure, erasure of social spatial boundaries, which I think is an important key aspect of the next kind of architecture that, that comes is this kind of finding a way of overcoming the pyramid of, of in inequity socially and, and economically, which, which finds the world uh, adding three projected three billion people in the next 50 years, but most of them at, a, at the lower economic end of the scale. And how do you really have a world of haves and have nots where you can't start to erase the socio-spatial boundaries that, that keep people apart. And so this technology is enabling people not to live with this kind of apartheid. But I think that there, there's something in it for us as, uh, as well. So I don't have any pretty pictures to show you, but I have some suggestions in terms of people. The first step in, in, in all of these things is to talk about it. Like no one knows what it is. No one knows how to incorporate it into your practice. So there are different people who are talking about it in different ways, and this is the first step in getting to an answer. So uh, some of these, there are many others. Maybe you can suggest them, them that I don't, I don't know. But the, there's a rebirth strategy. So the old line HOK Sports uh, reemerged as populous, and if you look at their web page, and we can may maybe do this in a minute, is that th on their webpage they re-narrate why it is what they do because before it was sports venue, et cetera. I mean, it was, it was more hardware thinking. All of their language was based on hardware. But now the new populist website is actually re-narrating what the practice narrative is of the new company. And it's really more about you know, s social integration and togetherness, community, et cetera. Does that make their architecture different? Not yet. But the, the re-narration is the first step. Um, there's uh, the, what I would call the new synthesis strategy that employs methodology tools, organizational principles, and a practice ethos, which our friend Ben here is, is, is doing. And this strategy produces a very high level of response organizationally in the project outcomes. Uh, my question, I guess, to Ben is, is it too specific to be adopted as a model of practice by others because it's, it's so personal in, in, a, in, a, in a way? And, and so it's, it's really interesting watching the, this, this firm do its stuff. And then, the, but the question is, how do you take something that is, is really so calibrated to an individual's ethos? I mean, which is something that you can't really reproduce. Um, how does that inform the rest of us? Uh, there's a disciplinary transformation strategy, which I think more, more applies to landscape architects right now. Landscape architecture is undergoing a huge transformation in terms of thinking about, you know, what they do uh, and are really starting to address issues of identity and social interaction and ecology in a much more kind of uh, 
concrete way. And um, I guess the whole thing it is, will, there, will they be able to actually look at scalable systemic issues, and Martha's in there somewhere looking at, at scalable systemic issues in terms of uh, overall ecology of uh, the world. Um, informal, the informal city, there are th pe people like Urban Think Tank, which um, are positing alternative practices in terms of social design. Again, these are emergent things. It's a bottom-up effort, but without a top-down effort that matches, you can't really get to systemic change. And then there's the Netware City, with, where the social economic platform of, uh, is the city, and the connectivity happens at the level of comprehensive services, where you're trying to come to grips with objects, territory, and systems with an emphasis on infrastructure. But this, but th this last point is really, I think, behind the consolidation of, of global design industry to make service organizations that have the scale and breadth of expertise to address systems at a systemic level. And that's why they're getting to be so big. Uh, I'm not so sure that that leads to high levels of intelligence in terms of integration because at some point organizations become so big that they actually can't integrate their, their, their knowledge and deploy it properly. But I think that that's part of the reason why there is this kind of industry consolidation. Um, so my final slide comes to my questions today being in the reviews, which is that we need to come to a new synthesis with this netware business of how objects, territories, and systems kind of come together. And uh, in 19, the er, 1970s or earlier, uh, the, in, the, in the professions, uh, objects were for architects, territories were for landscape architects, and systems were for civil engineers. And this is certainly not the case now. This is all, all three of these territories require an interdisciplinary uh, uh, study of, of how the three things are, are actually made into something that is, holds together more. And I think part of the problem with all of this now is, w is the question of where man is in this, in this, uh, in this soup. And I think that's where um, there are open questions in my mind whether as architects we aren't starting in the wrong place because a lot of where we start is from issues of how you design something rather than what should it do for you. And so I think uh, I if all this exploration means anything to me, it comes back to having the right uh, premise about what the value is that you're delivering. I mean, all of these, all of these uh, iterations of different industries that disrupted each other and then finally achieved a new synth synthesis started with finding uh, a, a new reason to have value. And so that collided with an established order. It regenerated a, a new uh, synthesis in terms of what value they had together. And then it, it created a, a, a new generation of things happening. And then it, that happened over and over again. And so. I think this is where we're at. We're at this kind of inflection point. Again, the, the recession actually did us a favor in interrupting the trajectory of, of you know, building things that were silly and that didn't have, didn't have the value that we need to, to actually put back into the things that we do. And so this is the moment of revaluation where I think uh, everyone, not just us, but clients as well, are re trying to re-understand what is the value. And in that sense, the connectivity piece, however it's done virtually or in, f or in physical terms, I think is a, the next frontier where those values and I issues have to be reintegrated 
into the thinking of hardware and software uh, architecturally to uh, uh, produce a new sense of value and a new model for how that value is realized. Hopefully you do the, these and not that one. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Questions that people want to ask Paul? I mean, I, to be honest, had one question. Mm -hmm. Following up, let's say, the things that we were sort of exploring today. So I think one of the things that we're trying to figure out is how to sort of operate in this kind of more prototypical scenario-based versioning. One of the ideas is, for example, you're talking about systemic practice was possibilities of actually designing systems for opportunities that are latent, unknown, and in a sense trying to factor in a kind of working methodology that, like for example, the, the last project didn't have the, um, that you hadn't seen actually took on a very different legibility because of its way to be able to communicate with uh, basically those kind of specialists that could enable us to move things further. And for a course like the DRL, I think it would be interesting to get some of your advice in terms of how we can build this kind of notion of a prototype. Because in architectural practice, it operates very different from design disciplines, which have either beta versions in software or prototypes as kinds of variations before they go basically out into the public. But for us, we've, we don't actually operate that way. We go from design to implementation. And somehow, I think in terms of the we sh probably shouldn't, right? Well, I mean, it's working, but I think right. it does have certain problematics in terms of trying to understand what innovation actually could be. So though there is a lot of technology, and I think it operates in different kinds of markets, not always the best technology is put forward. And part of that is, I think, you know, there are different conditions, but I think it would be really interesting for us to get a little bit of your kind of feeling or suggestion on this, because it's something that we're struggling with in terms of trying to push this work and take it to the next level. Because the novelty, you're talking a lot about digital architecture, mm. but the novelty of the digital is, I think, it, over. It, it's, it, well, it's, it's because, uh, in the end, you have to understand, w we have to go back and understand what it's doing for us. I mean, what value are we trying to get derived from it? And I, I think that there was the Bell Labs phase of, of the whole thing, which is it doesn't really matter. It, it's if we if we just keep doing things, we'll discover it. So you'll you'll discover the the post-it note because you you thought you were making glue for one thing, and it turns out that it's really good for something else. And but I think that from an educational standpoint, that's too random. I mean, you're d you're actually counting on luck to to make that work. And I think the absence of even if there, it's a little arbitrary to try to find va to f try to find value that you're really aiming at, that you can aim the the effort at achieving certain kind of specific value that comes out of it. So whether it's cost or whether it's a buildability or whether it's manufacturer, but you know, it, it, if it's specific enough, what gets measured actually gets done, right? So if you if you don't measure it or you can't find a way of putting your arm around it, how do you know it's good or bad, or how do you know that you you did it or not? I mean, I, I mean, we we had my my whole thing is not to make architecture that pat, but what I'm saying is that if you want to make progress in something, not knowing where you're going with it is a problem. <laughs> and I think a lot of times we don't know where we're going with it. I mean, we're, we're, we're experimenting, but we, we don't know, like, okay, so what value did you get out of it? Now, it didn't do something else for you, but it did do that for you. So, okay, so now, you know, it, it's, we can, we can go and try to get that other thing done. But I, I think that some of the projects not, not, not all of them, but you know, some were d too diffuse in terms of the number of objectives th without hierarchy. And so you, you actually start looking at it and you go like, well, how do I get value out of that? It's like, what did it do for us? And you go like, well, I don't know. And so, so I think the clearer you can be about at the beginning what your premise is and where you're going, what you expect out of it that you seems to have value, I think it's a better navigation of it. 
I'm just, I'm just kind of curious because you use the word value and values change. Value think, to whom? Yes, to yeah. whom and, and for what? And, and, and right. I think and this is the one thing that I just want to ask a right. little bit about because in this kind of environment, right. I think the benefit that we have is that we are actually allowed, at least afforded, this kind of more speculative approach. This kind of research orientation doesn't necessarily mean it has to be prescriptive. No, it doesn't so have just to be kind prescriptive. But, but I'm saying in terms of... But, uh, yeah. Can uh, uh, negotiate that. Um, I know where you're coming from and you're quite right. It depends also a little bit on the at which point in the historical cycle of innovation you are. Mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning, middle, or towards the end where, where, where you already know what you want and you want more of it. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of in the transition period in the middle where we where we, we know um, many many things already we want but we also don't want to uh, set the agenda and the criteria with the degree of prescription and prior to the evolving project like you face with the commission in the real commission you ha you you, are, you, are, you 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 the brief is pretty stitched up and there's marginal reinterpretation possibility and then you draw on a universe of Formal universal repertoire to to feed that. In academia, I would say it's it's a, the the, the, the um, in the end the final product has to be a kind of coincident of form and function, uh, morphology, performance, uh, concept and value. Uh, and and, yeah. and but in in the academic research uh, we need to um, we are much more open that uh, with, with the precise value as long as we find at the end. So we, we're setting out the projects with more with abstract formal researchers, technique researchers, uh, but framed in a domain where we think, uh, or, or, or abstractly framed, these kinds of processes lead to kinds of results which have properties which are relevant for many contemporary situations. For instance, you take a slogan like intensification of relations. Mm -hmm within a construct and of the construct to its external environment, sensitivity and so on. That is, you, uh, there, there are lots of institutions and there's a lot of value in the contemporary world and, and, and you can frame it on that level. But still, in which the, the specification of this is driven by the apparatus, by the formal research. When it, in the end, draws the functions to itself and the end result is a compelling, convincing uh, form function correlation. But you couldn't have given that brief at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You must allow the brief to be stated at the end, together with the result. And this, this is this is something what 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 I think is is the system systemic dif difference between kind of a research, let's say, or let's say kind of a, a process in the in, in the real world we're doing in the office, where you where you confronted with relatively prescribed and and, and, and even a kind of random series of commissions and here where you where you have to you have to leave it open otherwise you you cannot right. um, because a lot of the creative processes are in fact um, um, uh, maintain that moment of unpredictability mm -hmm. and then there's this, this kind of alertness uh, to 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 hunting browsing for value right whereas before it was given what value produced and we we just know some value needs to be found and of course, at, as the prog project progresses, you kind of narrow the frame, right. and the area of s the search area becomes right. narrow. But there's still, but if the students should suddenly jump into another branch of the search space and find the final stage is more a, luck a lucky hit, then it is also the better solution. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way I would, would, would put it. But I think your, your insistence on the value is important because, particularly in the phase two, that. We um, um, we don't want to. Uh, that's uh, our commitment here. That we'll present projects where the value remains totally out in the open. Right. But having said that, I still agree, in particular in the early phases of the cycle well, of innovation, yeah. that some careers, right, some project, even some whole careers, could still make a contribution if they themselves never reach a point of value. Mm -hmm but give resources to others to match to value. Mm -hmm. So I accept that, not in the definition of the DFL, right. but lots of other yeah. studios here, they never reach the point of value, they 
you know, capable to think right. <laughs> value perhaps or unwilling to and they have kind of a uh, systematic, systematically false constant of thinking you don't need value right. but they still exist and do work and then uh, that's the way I would kind of frame that and, and, right. and it's always good to have characters who insist on value on those who postpone that <laughs> moment <laughs> and, the, and, and the rationality right. is the dialectic of this working itself through. Right. Yeah, and, 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 and my, my own baggage is re really uh, architect as political actor. And so, you know, it, uh, the, this discussion with about value and everything is, is, is weighted, in my, my view, be because I come from a tradition of architect as political actor, and therefore you, you, you actually look at society and you, you meet society on its ground as, a, as an actor, and, and therefore part of the educational process, not of everybody, I mean, this isn't a, a blanket statement, but part of the profession uh, has to be trained to, to actually meet, meet, meet that on the, on, the, on the ground. And then, of course, there are other parts, branches of the profession that don't have to ha do any, have anything to do with that. So I'm not uh, one of those who think it's a monolithic thing. It's a very, it's, it, architecture is very inclusive in terms of ways of being in the world. So I think that that's, that, that's true. But I, I think where you're at in, in, in terms of this, from what I saw, is that you're past the initial phase of, uh, of the thing and you, you are somewhere in the middle and so now the question is how do, you, uh, how do you get your parameters straight so that it's not a free for all but then again you're not closing down the investigation in a way that produces yet even more predictable. <laughs> then we would have failed a purpose because right. these are not real projects. Right. They don't exactly. have to be built, they, they don't have to function. Right, right. They're, they're, <laughs> you know, they're, they're liberated they're, So, so they're, they, 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 their primary criterion right. is originality. Um, and, and, you know, and to show an original possibility of a form function mm -hmm. relationship. Mm -hmm. And you have to, of course, be selective about which yeah. aspects of reality you bring in right. and, to, and to think, to treat it as if it was the really real, which is the total misunderstanding of your, of your task and position. And I agree, also another point I, I think is interesting that you have, uh, in terms of educational institutions, you said some people need to be trained to meet, the, meet society where it is at and mm -hmm. deliver state of the art. Mm -hmm. I 100% agree with that. And, um, but um, this school and a few others uh, have a different social role. Not sp explicitly stated, but we are subverting and diverting resources officially dedicated to education way for research because there is no other right. investment no other into way. research on that level. Right. So they, 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 there's a kind of subterfuge, <laughs> kind of false consciousness of, 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 of a social process where, it, where, where, it, where, where research is required, mm. is not given, and therefore comes an underground through places right. like the UA. The, the other thing, though, with that research is, whether it's disciplinary or can be interdisciplinary, and one of the curious things for me is how you get research on an interdisciplinary basis, because that, that's the other ingredient. Some of these projects required the input of an interdisciplinary team in order for it to have more intelligence. Like the, 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 the wetlands project would have been inc incredible if you had gotten this team with a really kind of aqua, aquamarine kind of biologists or whatever. You know, you, you, that interaction would have produced an amazing, I, th I, I believe, it would have produced an amazing result. I, mean, I sometimes been puzzling about right. this because you have something like Harvard, right. GSD, you have the I mean, there's endowed university, and there isn't a research part department in the true sense. Right. And as far as I understand, there's been it has been in existence only once. And this was the Freyotto mm -hmm. Research uh, um, uh, Institute in, in Stuttgart. Mm -hmm. I haven't looked closely in the, in, into, the, into the institutional mm -hmm. setting up in, in of this, but I feel that it's been extremely powerful and, and uh, something which we here cannot compete with, with a, with a kind of a year and a half tenure of, of, mm -hmm. of students without experts, without you know, and, and right. what we saw this afternoon, the last project, is the closest we've ever gotten here. And but but it, it, it pales to nothing in comparison to to, to, to the kind of research which happened and uh, well, it's to nothing. <laughs> I mean, say the uh, 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 the Fraud Institute with 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 with, uh, with 
you know, long tenure, dedicated full-time researchers with resources mm. and so on. So sure, I'm sure. asking you, why don't you do that in Harvard? Hmm? Why don't you put something, a show on the road somewhere? <laughs> in Harvard or elsewhere. <laughs> Harvard's in as bad shape as uh, anywhere else, let me tell you. No, no, it, it's, it, it's, uh, we, we, ha we have somebody here who can talk, ex that talk to that point. <laughs> right, Martha? <laughs> uh, any questions? So I think we'll leave it at that and hope people can join us tomorrow for round two of the DRL jury. And until then. Thank you very much. Thank you.